Recently here at Make Noise, we were excited to hear about the release of a new composition by our friend Richard Devine. The piece is called Recursion Constructors. It's a multi-channel piece commissioned by the University of Huddersfield. Richard used a new computer music tool set called Flucoma, or Fluid Corpus Manipulation, to create several morphogene reels for use in a Make Noise-centered modular system that formed the foundation of the piece. If you followed Make Noise for a while, then you know that this isn't the first time Richard Devine has used our instruments or been a part of the company's history. You might recall in the recent Tony Talks tape video, Tony mentioned that Richard and Josh Kay were the ones who really turned him on to the possibilities of granular synthesis. When the shared system was first created and sent to artists for use in the shared system record series for Make Noise Records, the first release in the series and on the imprint was Creature by Richard Devine. Richard performed and spoke at Make Noise's five-year anniversary in 2013 and again at the 10-year anniversary in 2018. It had been a while since we had the chance to catch up, so I gave Richard a call to talk about the new piece, Recursion Constructors. Before we get into it, I want to quickly direct your attention to the links in the video description. You can find Recursion Constructors on Bandcamp, as well as a video version on YouTube. A lot of detailed information about the construction of the piece at the Flucoma website, and even a video made by Richard where he goes into the mechanics of the patch in detail. So make sure to follow those links to get the full story. Okay, let's take a look at a clip from Recursion Constructors by Richard Devine. So we saw that you have a new piece called Recursion Constructors, which um, we have put some links to it in the video and people should definitely go check that out as well as this talk or even before this talk if, if they have time. But uh, so uh, can you tell us just a brief overview of it before we uh, dig into other questions? Yeah, <clears throat> the um, Recursion Constructors piece was a electroacoustic composition that it was commissioned by Huddersfield University in Manchester, England. It's been an ongoing project for about four years. Hmm. Um, I'd been doing some periodic visits coming out to the university as they were building the tool set. The tool set I'm referring to is the uh, Flow Comma tool set, which is a, a set of Max MSP objects and Super Collider objects, and I think they also have made it available as pure data. But basically, yeah, it was a set of um, tools for sound manipulation and creation for um, and there's dozens of different tools from granular slicing objects um, to resynthesis objects to uh, all kinds of really really interesting stuff um, there's even some machine learning um, AI based objects that sort of can take you know a cluster of sounds and group them together especially if you were using a lot of field recordings there was a lot of really interesting research that was involved in this project and Pierre thought it would be, he was trying to grab people from all dis, different um, backgrounds to become part of this project. I was working with a pretty diverse group of people. I think it was about 15 composers total that were asked to do this piece. And the goal was to create a 12 to 13 minute composition using the tools. And then mm. you could use whatever other external instruments that you like, whether 
you know, I know one of the uh, um, other performers used a cello. There was one guy that just used his voice as as the instrument that oh, wow. was being processed in Max MSP. So there was really, really interesting approaches to how to utilize these tools and create sounds. And, you know, and for my piece, I, I wanted to obviously use the modular system um, or squeeze it in any way that I can. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's, of course, my favorite instrument to perform and play on and thought it'd be a fun opportunity. And this also, it's interesting that we're having this interview because this is kind of, I kind of looked at this, the the Recursions Constructors piece is kind of like the part two of the, um, you know, the recursive piece. Um, recursion that I did mechanism, right? Recursion mechanism. That was yeah. going to be so my first just, question. Is this actually yes. uh, grown out of that? Yeah. So it was is it's basically almost like a part two, whereas recursion mechanism was more of a self. I want to say it, that was a generative patch where the you know the person didn't actually need to be at the at the controls to control that that particular piece. You could just walk in to the space, and the patch was self generating. It was self composing. It was doing all of the things on its own, and mm -hmm. that was. It, it was my first time trying to use a, use the the make noise shared system in a piece where um, it was doing the decision making, hmm. and it was also not only you know a patch that was controlling various op, um, modules within the system, but it was also controlling external instruments as well. So it was right. kind of taking influences from John Cage and. Um, you mentioned David uh, Tudor as well. Yeah, the David Tudor piece, the Rainforest piece, was really mm -hmm. interesting to me, which I I have on vinyl. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> I've had it ever since I was 17. I was really, really just, uh, I don't know, I was just really blown away by that concept, you know, David Tudor's approach to using physical objects and, you know, the, the physical space and everything about that piece was really interesting to me, kind of creating this cacophony of like a, like a synthetic jungle. It was just that the whole concept to me was just a, as a 17 year old was really, right. really interesting. <laughs> and that was, that was more of a, an installation too, originally. Am I right about exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an installation piece. So very much, I took the same approach when I came and did the re recursion mechanism. It was mm -hmm. an installation piece at the museum, at the, uh, Black, was it the Black Mountain? Yeah, Black Mountain uh, College Museum. College Center, Museum, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to take, you know, following the footsteps of, of David Tudor's uh, recursion mechanism and kind of do my own take on that, I guess, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, but having the, the Make Noise Shared System be the driving conductor, uh -huh. so to speak, the composer, in a way, the patch was driving the piece. Um, so I tried to really, really, really spend a lot of time on that that patch. So where you would have these moments of tension, and then there would be these parts where it's totally catch you off guard. I remember when Tony was standing there, it was like, "Whoa, man, the piece like scared me a few times." <laughs> where there were things that I wasn't expecting, and it was uh, it was like a really careful balance to get that patch to do exactly what I wanted it to do, mm -hmm. and it to be constantly different. Like you would come in. You could come in at eight in the morning. It would be doing something totally different. You could come in, you know, like eight hours later, and it'd be somewhere completely different and doing some something completely, you know, completely timbrely different. And, yeah. and um, so that that was the goal for that. Um, That's but, kind of yeah, the dream thinking, with a generative piece to be able to make it piece. surprise you, right? Like instead of just playing totally. a similar thing all the time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I really, really tried hard to where there you couldn't figure out. That there was any repetition at all there was no you know you know it was, it was one of those pieces that was uh you know that, that that was the end goal was to really really kind of mystify and enamor people in that experience recursion constructors was was different it's kind of like a part two but instead of the system driving and conducting the patch it was me mm -hmm. that was doing all of the timing and changing this was more of a piece that was more or less, there were parts that I had planned out. So I was curious about, yeah, I, this is a recursion, there's a, there's a theme of recursion here, and I noticed that one thing you added to recursion constructors that I don't think you mentioned with recursion mechanism is a matter of uh, feeding back the, 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 record, or the uh, live recording of the acoustic instruments back into the system. That's and, right. 
and mm-hmm. um, and then you also were were working from these new sounds that you'd created with this new Max tool set, mm-hmm. um, and was and and then you were also uh, doing a lot of gestural work to be live creating the the changes in the piece. So those are a few pretty large differences between those two pieces. Yes, well, I forgot to m- mention with the recursion mechanism. Yeah, there was some live recording. I was recording back into the mm-hmm. Morphogene, so there was a lot of internal live processing happening, um, like sound on sound stuff, and mm-hmm. just you know, um, I think I was yeah, I used, uh, I, th- I believe I brought the water phone. I brought a couple of like slinkies, and mm-hmm. I had like a trash can spiral. I brought all kinds of weird objects that yeah. would be interesting just to have some physical like resonating objects that were once you hit them they obviously make a noise in the room that but it was just this nice sort of mixture that sort of interplayed in in this juxtaposition of like synthesis and and um live recording and you know it was uh it was uh, yeah like um with uh recursion constructors it was, it was a bit different i did use a few i did f- have a few pieces i did have um I think I used the slinky coil, the trash can spiral symbol. Uh, what's the guy's name? He builds these like metal sculpture pieces. I used one of those mm-hmm. as well. And I used the coma field kit as well. So I had oh, some right. contact mics and some other stuff that was um, that was not being recorded by the morphogenes with this piece. I was using three morphogenes for the recursion constructors piece. And that was defined by these three reels that I had already had recorded all of the material ahead of time. And I knew exactly what each reel would be doing and how it would play into the piece. So Mm -hmm. it was, I had, I was able to plan things out a little bit more. So I knew based on the stuff that I had recorded for each reel, I knew that it's specific parts, which was really nice. I knew for each one of the morphogenes, I was like, I know for this the set, I know exactly at what time I want a certain sound to play, and then I'm going right. to be able to gesturally play with that sound and then move on to the next idea. So it was, it was more slower paced than the recursion mm-hmm. mechanism, which was just real time grabbing stuff. You know, yeah. it was a very very different mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Whereas this is, it was constructing like. Um, composition based off of these sounds that I had already created and right. processed and were ve- they're very deliberate gestures and things and combinations of sounds that were meant to go with each other with this piece. It was more of a planned rather than a generative <clears throat> right. piece. Yeah. It was yeah, it was a much more I was trying to go through very distinctive movements and parts um to my best of my abilities. Um but yeah, so it was a very different approach. Yeah. Then, yeah, you have a um, when you have a composition that's kind of like in a box in a way that occupying a space over days is a completely different. Just you have a completely different set of goals there. That makes a lot of sense. Totally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with this one, it was it was it was definitely more deliberate things that I wanted to have happen, and and like I said, I didn't exactly get them perfect every time. It was kind of like practicing through the patch, and you know, you there's certain parts and things you want the listener to go through Mm -hmm. as they journey through the composition and it's it's hard to to make the timing i think timing is 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 really difficult especially with a piece like that where you're just kind of you're on the fly and you're kind of like you know i really truly tried hard (laughs) to get it to feel like the flow between the transitions was natural and Mm -hmm. stuff um you know maybe i don't know how many people would notice it but yeah like i said i felt like i rushed some parts and then some parts i let go on to a little too long but i guess it's, that's the beauty of it you know it's it's yeah. never going to be the same every time so you kind of have to just sometimes just go with the best best take you get and hopefully it's good <laughs> <laughs> i noticed in the uh this sort of supplementary documentation that you provided like there's a video where you explain uh part of the patch which we'll also link to um you were using for each reel basically the maximum amount of time you could fit into yes. a reel. So you're talking about <laughs> between three of them, like almost nine minutes of different sounds nine that minutes. you have. And it's um, a lot. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I think that the, I guess one thing that I've I consider you in particular kind of a master at is taking these large like a 
libraries of sound and managing to organize them in some way that you can uh, travel through in a way that you have, I, I guess, total control over. Obviously, sounds like it's not exactly quite there, but but I still, you 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 are able to organize these sounds in a purposeful sort of way, like as a sound librarian or something like that. That I think uh, that that's one of the things that that can be very challenging with this kind of with this kind of work, you know. Absolutely, and I think just my work as working as a sound designer for you know 25 plus years mm -hmm. you know that really really helps me my ears are able to like take sounds no matter what where they're derived from whether they're synthesized or they're field recordings or you know some other method of of uh, generation was used but I, I have a good or i feel like i have a good grasp <laughs> maybe some people would disagree with me but of being able to group these sounds together so that I knew that the evolution and the way that I could move through each of these reels in conjunction with how the patch is moving, that they would all kind of work together. These these yeah. pieces would somehow timbrely and there were gestures and there were things and things that would kind of happen that would kind of, I knew that would kind of be like, all right, here's a part where there's this gesture is going to happen and it's going to set off this thing to happen. And then it gives me a second to where there might be some part where I'm going to have a bit of tension where there's like a drone for about a minute where, you know, it give me a, a few seconds to get the next set of sounds set up ready for the next part that I was going to eventually move into the next right. movement. Um, so yeah. And a lot of that, like, a, like you said, it's like, it's orchestrating and thinking about really, really thinking about how the sounds are going to work and, and in like a sequence of events in the order and then the, the timbres and how like you're going to shift from, one mood or idea to the next in a way mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like having a uh, like telling a story i was really almost kind of like you know i think i mentioned in the band camp or uh description it was like kind of like putting the listener in this space and kind of mm -hmm. telling a story in a way like this i don't know exactly what that story is but it's just this unusual sonic you know uh you know journey of uh -huh. just just different unusual textures and spaces and putting you in these different you know i don't know how to describe it it's 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 hard to mm -hmm. pinpoint exactly what <laughs> it's well, I, you know it's cool. <laughs> i have a question though uh so sure. did you, in terms of creating that story you you were talking about how you were arranging these sounds together were you thinking about as you created each sound initially were you thinking about how it would fit into that broader picture or did you create all the sounds first and then kind of go through and decide which ones were going to work together. It, it's the latter. Yeah I, yeah. I went through and designed a lot of the sounds first and the approach was, I was trying to do something similar to what Morton Sabotnik, his approach was like, you know, it's like sound characters, these gestures, they're kind of like a vocabulary that you use to express different you know things as a piece is playing you know you have these like flutters or you have these things that are really animated you have these things that are really subtle and quiet or it's it's a, it's like an expressive language in a way that i was trying to develop and that's kind of how i was thinking about the sounds was like mm -hmm. developing this like expressive vocabulary of gestures that would sort of work together to express different um different moods and parts mm -hmm. in a way so that's kind of how I looked at what, you know, when I was designing the sounds, I was kind of thinking like, you know, all right, I have these set of sounds that will create tension and maybe be a transition. These sort of would be like transition gesture sounds where they take you from one idea to another. So I had like a group of sounds that were doing that for that, for that specific purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had other sounds that would just be beds of drones or things that would be these periods, periods of subtleness that, you know, would kind of give me a second to recalibrate and think about how I was going to bring in the next section. Um, cause w with a piece when you're obviously, as you know, this too, cause you've, you, you do a lot of patching, you know, there's a lot of performing, but there's also pre thinking ahead of time of what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it something where you, um, you know, that like in a particular place on the organize knob, you're going to probably be in a drone. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and you um, you could listen to the reels. I think the reels are up there too. You can kind of 
see the little bit of the, here the method to my madness is how <laughs> i organize some of the sounds yeah but yeah there was there was some process acoustic stuff yeah there were lots of drones there was lots of um weird um dsp processing specifically using the flow common tool set from right. yeah huddersfield so i was yeah. trying to use as many of their max processing tools as possible um as a primary focus of where all the sound processing was coming from mm-hmm, the generation mm-hmm. but then taking that and then trying to perform those sounds that i created in in a way that was purposeful and trying to create like you know, very intent articulations and gestures and and movements and and try to come up with a piece that was interesting and compelling to to the listener in a way to where you know like you know it's really also trying to explore um, taking their tool set and try to find these interesting sounds within some of the tools that I had available to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was another goal was just try just just to see what would happen. There was a lot of stuff during the prototyping of, of, of making some of those sounds and, and working on that piece that was just a, a lot of exploratory. There was a lot of f- successes and failures, you know, there was a lot mm-hmm. of stuff that worked and didn't work. And, um, but for the most part, yeah, I really wanted to, to, um, to, to utilize their tool set in the best way that I could to create a, a really compelling composition. That was my, the most important goal was just to create a really, com- a really interesting composition with their tool set. Yeah part of the project was kind of documenting the process and, mm-hmm. and which some of that I, I put on the uh, Bandcamp page. And then we had a, uh, another link to where there's some max patches to kind of emulating some of my uh, approaches to how I did it. Um, and um, one thing I wish they would have put up on there uh, on, on that particular page is I wish they would have put a picture of the, the actual shared system that I mm-hmm. configured. I actually have a, uh, I sh- I'll send it to you guys. I have it on my, um, Modular grid. Oh yeah. Account. Okay. Oh cool. So I'll send I'll send you guys that so you guys can see the basic because in in the video it's all there's so many cables and stuff and it's yeah barely covered you can kind of see some of the <laughs> but there is a share there is a shared system in there with a skiff uh, with a Renee and a bunch of other stuff and um, yeah in the video you taught you kind of went over like which modules were doing what things and overall mm-hmm. I have to say like I mean I rarely see a big patch like that that's so well documented it really really uh like gives a lot of information available about this patch that i think is is really cool and i feel like that yeah. was such a big thing with in early electronic music people wanted to make scores of stuff and that's now there's mm-hmm. so many different ways to do things that that's mostly just kind of lost you know there's just like some little description and that's it you know so it's cool that yeah. you kind of brought that back for this I tried to, yeah, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to have people to kind of dive in and have some fun tools to also play with. Mm-hmm. When the uh, we had the link page from Huddersfield, so they could download Max patches for people that don't have modular systems that just want to kind of understand some of the more basic concepts of like some of the, you know, the uh, the individual components of like how I was doing certain things within the patch. Right. Um, and yeah, that was that. That to me is, I think sometimes the the building and construction of the PC architecture of how it's all put together can be just as interesting as the piece itself for some people, Mm -hmm. some, maybe some (laughs) people find it boring, but I have a lot of friends that are always like curious about that kind of stuff. So I was like, you know what, I'll, I'll deep dive and like try to document and provide as many examples and sounds and stuff for people to play with. And you never know, maybe it's, it's, it could be like an inspirational springboard for their own music compositions or ideas. So it's always fun to kind of, put those in the put the, the linear notes in there and kind of I always love it when people put stuff you know patch notes and I've been trying I, I've tried to be good about that I've not always been great about that with every patch but generally with like a lot of my older patches that I used to put up I would put these very long <laughs> detailed descriptions of like right. my patch process and what modules I used and what you know why I chose certain sequencers or you know um, control voltage sources or mm-hmm. Um, you know, modulation sources or like the, the signal flow and the, what the, you know, a lot of people would kind of laugh at my six to eight page long patch descriptions. <laughs> but then I got a lot of great comments saying that, you know, Richard, that's really cool that you put these, you went, you took the time to 
to put the notes in because it gave a lot of people ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it also, stuff. it really gives the lie to any anybody who thinks it's just a bunch of random noise, you know? If anybody hears yeah. that, like, and they see, I mean, it's obvious that you're putting a lot of very, um, very detailed thought into this process. It's intent. And that you know, yes. you know what's going on here. It's very clear when we see stuff like that, so... Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that it wasn't it wasn't just thrown together in kind of a <laughs> haphazard manner. There was a lot of planning and practice and thought and yeah. and in every aspect of it, every point, you know, um, every element was very thought through, you know, to 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 like an anal <laughs> level of detail, <laughs> almost, you know. And uh, you know, so like I said, it's it's. But I think this is a challenging piece too. I, I don't think this is like a. A, a composition where you could just put it on and you kind of have to be in the right headspace to kind of absorb it. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of detail. And I know for a lot of my friends, when they heard it, they're like, Whoa, this is, this is a really insane piece of music, Rich. <laughs> that, it's, it's not ambient music. That's, that's probably no. true. It's uh it's something it's that not. you want to, you're going to pay attention to this when you're listening to it. For and, sure. And it's a very a, focused. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching and listening. Once again, if you're interested in this piece, make sure to check out all the links in the video description. There's lots of music and information to check out. Thanks so much to Richard Devine for taking the time to talk to us about your work. Thanks for watching and happy patching.